Good morning everyone. Hope everyone is having a good week. Need the coffee today. Um, I've got quite a few things to cover here so this might be a little bit lengthy but I've got some news of some things going on and something towards the end I want to cover um, from the Bible. A gem. Um, but first I want to mention that Watchtower, JW.org, is coming out with their summer convention videos and so far they have Friday mornings up and already disturbing and I'd like to play a clip. We truly hope that many accept our invitation to hear the enlightening public Bible discourse entitled, Friendship with God, How Possible? Now if we think about it, we're not born as friends of God because we're born as sinful offspring of Adam. Actually, if you think about it, we're born as enemies of God. Sometimes you'll hear people say of a little baby, look at that little angel. But more accurate would be to say, look at that little enemy of God. Now, of course, we love that little baby, and it's not, not hopeless because our loving Creator has made reconciliation with Him within the reach of of everyone. This is so um, wrong and evil on so many levels because according to their Bible Jesus said love. Love even your enemies. But what Let is basically saying that this baby is an enemy of God. Well you know what that makes him? A little devil. Because doesn't Satan mean resistor? An enemy of God? So he's basically saying this baby is a little devil. And this also reminded me when I was being beaten with a leather belt as a child that my dad would always be yelling at me that he had to beat the devil out of me. Well you can see this promotes that type of thinking. And so, when a parent is told this, that you have to beat the devil out of your child, you know, beat them into submission because they're an enemy of God, then this encourages this type of abuse. Very disturbing. Now, what does that do with the relationship between a parent and a child? And it goes along, I mean, it, it, it's just so much deeper than just the surface thing. Because think about it. If parents are told that that little baby that they have is an enemy of God, doesn't it make it that much easier for them to shun that child? And I got to thinking about that. If my mom believes that I was born an enemy of God, and then if I leave the organization, guess what? I'm an enemy of God. Apostates are an enemy of God. How disturbing is that? What does that have to do with love? If they claim that they are love and love everybody, and Jesus said, love even your enemies, then how can you possibly it's a conundrum. It, it really is. It really is. Now, next, going on to the next thing. Uh, the Telegraph, which is a news media outlet in the UK, is doing a year-long investigation against Jehovah's Witnesses Watchtower. And I'm going to put the link down below. And it is called Call Bethel. And they have three episodes up. Now, I know these episodes are available for 30 days for free. So, you know, get in and grab them or watch them um, because they are so good. And I love it how the Telegraph, and we've known the Telegraph has, you know, covered a lot of these stories for quite a while now. But I will put the link down below to that. Um... All right, let's see. Um, also, we have it from a reliable source that the redress scheme in Australia is starting to pay out JW victims. So this is good news. Very happy for you guys. I don't think it's enough, but that's my humble opinion. 
And also, um, I got an email from Aunt Nellie. Thank you, sweetie. And she wanted me to let everybody know in the English speaking um, side of the movement. I'm just going to read her email. Hi Kim, I want your help. I would like for you to announce in your channel that on the 9th of July, three countries, Mexico, Chile, and Panama, will be doing a protest in front of the Bethel facilities of each country. They want those Hispanic residents of these countries and who follow your channel to be aware of these facts. We will thank you very much. Hugs and kisses. So, you know, if you want to be a part of that, Mexico, Chile, and Panama, and I'm sure anyone in the Hispanic side of the community will know about this, and uh, you can get in touch with them, especially those that, of you that are bilingual, that would be good, and I'm sure even the English, if you don't know any Espinol, that even the English would be very well accepted. All right. Um, now I had done a video a while back and I had read a letter from Watchtower telling the JWs not to help the Ukraine JWs on a personal level to get in touch with the branch and they were going to handle everything and if you couldn't do anything else then donate money and then they would give relief to the Ukraine Jehovah's Witnesses and so I got a phone call and it really upset me and uh, I just was like wow wow but I got a phone call uh, from someone who is in the Poland Jehovah Witness um, group who were fleeing and from Ukraine and this person told me that they are getting no help from the branch the army has to help the JWs in the Ukraine and he says I don't know why they said that they're getting help because the branch isn't helping them this is coming from people who are in this small little group of the refugees from Ukraine so he says when they say they're helping they are not it is the army that is helping them. Um, he also told me that Valenzuela, that they were getting help from the branch and relief aid. And if I remember correctly, JWU.org even had a video about them helping the Jehovah's Witnesses in Valenzuela. And he says, no, they're getting help from Brazil. There's no help from the branch. And... Um, they were bragging about how many tons of food they have given in relief aid the branch and he says when you do the math it only comes out to eight ounces per person per day that's not a lot that's not enough to you know thrive on I mean that's barely rations to survive on eight ounces a day so this is like I said this was disturbing and to hear this from Pimos and those involved right there that the branch is not helping and I wish so badly that I could tell these Jehovah's Witnesses that are donating for the relief fund of Watchtower to help their fellow brothers and sisters that it's not getting to help to the brothers and sisters. It's going in Watchtower's pocket. Oh, that just makes me so angry. Um, I also want to mention uh, there has been another lawsuit, CSA case, filed in the Kings County Clerk on April 25, 2022. Uh, I'm not going to mention her name, but I'm just going to mention the last name is Sandstrom. And I'm going to put the link down below to this and you can get all of the documents but what is interesting about this case is that her and her attorneys have mentioned the governing body as defendants in this also 
And not only the Watchtower Bible Tract Society of New York and the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, but they have also named some other corporations that, you know, there was really no proof that they had any affiliation with Watchtower. So why would they be mentioned in this lawsuit? And I'm going to, here, Defendant, Watchtower Enterprises, Inc., Watchtower Foundation, Inc., and of course we know about the Kingdom Support Services and the Religious Order Jehovah's Witnesses, but I thought that was interesting that along with all these other tentacles, you know, branches of the Watchtower cult, they have these Watchtower Enterprises and Watchtower Foundation, Inc. Okay. Now I'd like to cover something else. You know how Mike and I, we've been doing research on the Bible. And when you go back and see some of these scriptures, and it's like, why didn't it click? Why didn't this click for the 49 years I was a Jehovah Witness? We know the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel, that whole story is even in the my book of Bible stories, you know, which we taught our kids as the truth. But how many of us and how many Jehovah's Witnesses really know what it is saying? It doesn't click. So I have my 1984 reference Bible here. And I want to read Genesis 28, 1. Consequently, Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and commanded him and said to him, You must not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Well, we know why. Well, they're false worshipers. Okay? So, travel. Get up, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, El, the father of your mother. So, it was his uncle. And take there for yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, Laban, the brother of your mother, his uncle. And God Almighty will bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you. We know that whole story. But how many of us catch this? Okay. Genesis 31. Verse 19. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep. Meanwhile, meantime, Rachel stole the teraphim that belonged to her father. Okay, so we keep reading. Doesn't click. But when you go down to the footnotes, teraphim, idols, images. Why was Jacob told to travel to his uncles and the relatives to get a wife? Which ended up would be his cousin. Why go marry your cousin? Because you don't want to take a wife from the land of Canaan because they're false worshipers. Okay? So Rachel steals the teraphim from her father, which means her father was worshiping false gods and had idols in the house. Well, wouldn't the kids also be the same type of worshipers with their father? Makes you wonder. Okay? So she steals these idols in ans uh, going over to verse 31 so it's 31 31 in answer Jacob proceeded to say to Laban it was because I was afraid for I said to myself you might tear your daughters away from me whoever it is with whom you may find your gods and then it has an asterisk and when you go down and it says my gods referring to false gods okay so whoever stole your gods uh, let him not live before our brothers examine for yourself what is with me and take them for yourself but Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them so Laban went on into the tent of Jacob and into the tent of Leah and into the tent of the two slave girls but did not find them finally he went out of Leah's tent and went on to Rachel's tent now Rachel had taken the teraphim and she resorted to putting them in the woman's saddle basket of the camel and she kept sitting upon them so Laban went feeling through the whole tent, but did not find them. Verse 35. 
Then she said to her father, Do not let anger gleam in the eyes of my Lord, because I am not able to get up before you, for the customary thing with women is upon me. So he searched on carefully, but did not find the teraphim. How many of us notice that? The customary thing with women. She told her father that she had her period, so she couldn't get up, and she was sitting on him. So did she really have it or was she lying? And the thing is, is why steal them and do this, this thing if you're not worshiping them? So how could you be a worshiper of Jehovah? Well, I'll get into that because there's actually like a legal aspect to this. So then when you go to the Insight book, volume two, and look under Laban, um, it tells this whole story and then when you go over to page 186 this is what it says Laban was very concerned about retrieving the teraphim or household idols that's what they were which Rachel unknown to Jacob had stolen these he was unable to find for Rachel kept them concealed and she was sitting on them Laban may have become influenced in his religious ideas by the moon-worshipping people among whom he dwelt. Moon-worshippers! And this may be indicated by his use of omens and his possession of teraphim. However, it should be noted that it was likely more than merely religious reasons that made Laban so anxious to locate and retrieve the teraphim. Tablets unearthed at Nuzi near Kirkguk Iraq revealed that according to the laws of patriarchal times in that particular area, possession of such household idols by a woman's husband, which would have been Jacob, could give him the right to appear in court and claim the estate of his deceased father-in-law. Hence Laban may have thought that Jacob himself stole the teraphim in order to dispossess Laban's own sons later. This may explain why, on failing to locate the household gods, Laban was anxious to conclude an agreement with Jacob that would ensure that Jacob would not go back with the household gods after Laban's death to deprive his sons of their inheritance. So just a little bit of history. And um, in the Bible, and then you've got a question, and this is where critical thinking comes in. If Jacob was told to travel to this other area and get a wife from his relatives and not to take a Canaanite woman for a wife because they were false worshipers, well, if Laban's household were false worshipers with the moon cult, you just gotta like shrug your shoulders and say, you know, what in the world? But this is what Mike and I, and XJW Jane Doe, Elder's Wife Jane Doe, and many others on YouTube have been doing. It's like, look at the scriptures, the Bible, with fresh eyes, and realize, yeah, there's history, there's legends, there's myths, some truth does get through on some of this stuff. But, it's not the Word of God. God did not have anything to do with writing this. Man did. Man edited it. And, you know, something just occur occurred to me, getting back to Let, saying that that little baby was an enemy of God. I mean, if this is how their God feels... No wonder he could kill David and Bathsheba's baby then, and it was okay. And it's funny because I was having an argument one day with a Baptist minister wannabe that is in this community, and he's very pro-King James. And when I was having this discussion, I was like, why would God strike that baby down? Oh, well, he wanted to keep the bloodline pure, you know. That was a child that was born with adultery and out of wedlock. And it's like, but isn't the same bloodline for Solomon? 
if the parents sinned, then, you know, that same baby, Solomon, would have had the same defect. And if all children are born as enemies of God, it, it just creates this whole huge circular reason and conundrum. So, anyway, that is all I have to say. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and have a happy 4th of July. Stay safe. And we love you. You have a wonderful day. Bye.